What did I expect from a show about a bunch of teenagers doing a treasure hunt? A love triangle in the Bermuda Triangle? Sure. But somehow Outer Banks has an alligator attack and then like a date to the archives. They are translating diaries written in Gullah, deciphering plat maps, uncovering the realities of the transatlantic slave trade, and they've been to school like twice. They are not experts on historical preservation. They are just 16 year olds who are passionate. And from another person who makes up for not having a history degree with passion, I appreciate it. So today we're going into how Outer Banks makes history legitimately cool. So let me set the scene and I'm gonna do this as quickly as possible so that you don't click off. This is the Outer Banks in North Carolina, which is a real place, but everything I say from this point on is fiction. They just had a huge hurricane and this is John B. He will always be called John B by every single character with no exceptions. If someone called him John, I fear there would be more fistfights than the show already has and it's already too many. John B has a dad who is missing. He is not called John B, he is called Big John. John B and Big John lived in this house, presumably forever. They are on the working class side of the island. Big John is obsessed with a ship that sank in 1829 with a boatload of gold on it called the Royal Merchant. John B just keeps living on his own, but is being threatened with foster care, which would take him off the island away from his three very cool friends. But after the storm stuff starts getting weird, they're finding boats, but not the big boat, but just little boats. And two of the most classically scary men are over the top violent with pretty much everyone they interact with. And then they do something that I think will hurt anyone who's ever researched anything. They steal Big John's books from his little office. It's such a cute research base and it looks like it took decades to collect those books. And as someone with her own collection of weird research books, I took it very personally for him. In the first season, it's John B's journey trying to figure out what happened to his dad, find the missing gold from the royal merchant. His friends are his backup and are consistently putting themselves in dangerous situations to help him out. I'm gonna introduce his friends in order of most likely to get everyone killed to least likely. JJ. He is the only person in this group who could diffuse a situation with comedy but he chooses to never use it. He takes yes and to a new level where it's like, oh, I'm gonna hit you with this. And he's like, I'm gonna, I have a gun. <laughs> You're like, whoa. He is convinced he's gonna end up in jail and follow in his father's footsteps and therefore makes decisions every episode that put everybody in a terrible spot. This might make it sound like I don't like him, but he is my favorite character. Then there's Kiara. Everyone calls her a kook, which is the name for rich people in this universe, but she seems pretty working class. Both of her parents work at the restaurant that they own. She is very committed to her principles and when people do bad things, she's happy to call them out, which I think is a good thing in general, but not great when you scream murderer in front of a person who's still holding the murder weapon. Next up, Sarah. She's called the Kook Princess. She is the daughter of a wealthy man whose backstory is a mystery because I don't think the writers know what type of rich they want him to be. At the beginning, she's framed as crazy and careless, but once you meet the rest of her family, you're like, wow, that is a very stable person, all things considered. They also kind of suggest that Sarah is a bit of a player, but I think she's just not that interested in monogamy with a, a boy who acts like he's 62. And then there's Pope. Pope is too smart to be doing any of this stuff. And him giving in isn't him being susceptible to peer pressure. I think he just happens to have the most convincing friends on earth. He also has the biggest storyline glow up, which I'll get into later. And it really kind of becomes the Pope show. And, and I like it. After watching season one of this show, I was like, oh, this is like if the movie Captain Ron and the Jason Bourne trilogy had a baby. But then in season two, I realized it's more of a like three men in a baby situation. Jason Bourne, Captain Ron, and the Finding Your Roots show with Henry Louis Gates really becomes a genealogy journey. I mentioned a first date to the archive library. It all starts with John B going to Sarah's house to get patched up from one of the 45 injuries he gets in this season. <laughs> On the wall, we see a portrait of this man. John B is surprised to see a black man as the founder of this huge plantation estate before the Civil War ended. The man is Denmark Tanny, who showed up out of nowhere and bought the surrounding land with gold. Conveniently, John B has a ship inventory in his hand and sees that Denmark Tanny was a cook on the Royal Merchant. When Sarah's family bought the house, they found a diary and other documents and they donated them to the Chapel Hill archives. This is actually the most unrealistic part of this show. That family would not donate something to a library. It's just, it doesn't fit. Now their experience at the archives is not the same as what I've experienced when I've done research. 
I don't have to wear a blazer. And also that trustee pass must be surrounded by $100 bills because they got in the same day they requested. It usually takes like a week to a month. I was jealous. But I like when the show like does stuff with historical documents and this scene is a good example of it. From the very first monologue, we're hearing about the Pogues and the Kooks. The Pogues are working class people who are often working for the Kooks who are extremely wealthy. And when John B is dressing up to go to the archives, he is aware that the whole mechanism behind historic preservation is designed to make him uncomfortable. And Sarah, on the other hand, is not uncomfortable in this environment. She knows how it works, she knows where things are, and how to ask to get what she wants. It's through her that they're able to uncover so much, but it's not that she's smarter, it's that she understands the system better and is able to use it to her benefit. There is a ton of racism and classism that the Pogues keep coming up against. They are literally getting the shit beat out of them so much. And there's a united awareness by the cops, the kooks, just random wealthy families that they do not have power. They might not have parents to back them up or money, but scariest of all, they don't have people who believe them. And I think that's actually what makes the show so compelling is you as the viewer believe them and trust them and want to see them do well. And that is not something they're getting from their community. This is a complete side note, but Rafe is a terrifying misogynist and racist. And I, I don't wanna see any more people doing fan edits, not him. Now I wanna dive back into the history of Outer Banks. I think a lot of people wanna claim that this history feels really far-fetched, but I think when you start looking deeper at local history, you realize that so many historical documents have just never had someone look at them particularly closely. And if they have, they probably didn't have the context to connect things. And also so much of the story is based on small bits of real history. So the character of Denmark Tanny was vaguely inspired by a real life Denmark, Denmark Vesey. He was enslaved in Charleston, South Carolina until he was 32 when he won his freedom via a lottery. He was a carpenter, a church founder, and was planning a slave revolt in Charleston. The white members of the community found out about this planned revolt and the court convicted Vesey. They did this not through a regular court proceeding. It was done completely in private and in secret, and they were not allowed to hear the testimony against them. In total, 65 men were convicted and 35 men were hung, including Denmark Vesey. In the first season, John B's friends are helping him get answers, and he's really doing this all fueled by a personal vendetta and a desire to get vengeance. There's this idea that he deserves the gold because his dad almost got it. And then partway through season two, something completely shifts. Pope finds out his ancestor is Denmark Tanny. All of Denmark's clues and notes were to let his children know where the things that belonged to them were. The gold, but also the unmarked grave of his wife and their mother. Denmark was killed by members of the Limbray family. And then 200 years later, Pope is still being haunted by the same family who are trying to find health and wealth and do not care about the human lives along the way. The Limbrays dig up Cecily Tanny's grave and leave it unburied when they don't find what they're looking for. Pope is then there with his descendants' remains. The show treated this moment with gravity, but I wanted to slap the camera when it focused on John B and Sarah. Not the time. But I do hope that the show continues to understand the difference between a singular personal hardship and centuries of grief and trauma. I'm so curious as to what will happen in season three, but I, I hope so badly that they continue to understand the difference in scope. Also, if you wanna learn more about graves on plantations, you should watch this video from the New York Times that I'm linking below on what's happening to enslaved people's burial sites in Louisiana that are on land that's owned by petrochemical plants. The main message that I learned from Outer Banks was how important local history is. And even if it doesn't result in gold, just pulling the strings of history and seeing where they lead is, I don't know, pretty nice and cool. Like for example, I was reading the diary between two men who are in a romantic relationship. And in that, I found out that Isabella Stewart Gardner, the woman who founded that museum that got heisted and also was one of the wealthiest women in Boston, she had a mouse run across her face while she was sleeping. And to me, that knowledge is priceless. So if you check out some archives online or in person, just remember you do not have to be wearing a safe sucker blazer. I'm about to be watching season three, so if you like this video, let me know and maybe we can talk about the next season together. You should subscribe if you think that this was cool. Um, rumor has it, Pogue subscribe and kooks, they just, they leave mean comments, so you don't wanna be a kook.
Don't leave any mean comments. I'm Kendra Gaylord. I talk about shows and movies and how it connects to history. I also have a podcast called Someone Lived Here. Okay, thanks for watching everybody. Bye.